Hello everyone, welcome to the Central Beloit YouTube channel and thanks for checking us out. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week at centralwire.com or on Facebook and Instagram. We hope this message meets you right where you're at. Enjoy. Everybody, what's up? It's good to see everybody. Hope everybody had a great Christmas. And listen, if you wasn't here for Christmas Eve for the state line, um, what an awesome, awesome time we had. It was an amazing spectacle, our candlelight service. Guys, through our three worships, we had a chance to worship with just under 3,000 people on our three campuses. Just under 3,000 people. Absolutely phenomenal. And I just want to say really quickly, for those of you on our First Impressions team who, if you greeted or you served uh, or you helped out on our safety team uh, or you are on our prayer team or wherever you were serving, God, our choir, did y'all see our choir was absolutely amazing, <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, you guys went above and beyond the call of duty on behalf of our pastor, the greatest pastor on the planet, Pastor Dave Clark. Yeah, and all of us here at Central Christian, we just wanted to tell you thank you for going above and beyond the call of duty, making so many of our visitors feel welcome um, here at Central Christian. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, Dave's not here today, but today is Dave's birthday. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, he may be watching online. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Dave. Super Dave, you're awesome. Happy birthday to you. Give it up for him. He's awesome. He's going to beat me up next week for doing that, but he, he's, he's worthy. Everybody, um, so listen, can y'all believe? Man, this is the last weekend of the year. Not only the last weekend of the year. Yeah, I'm going to say, Kimmy, you give me a chance, right? Last weekend of the decade. Can y'all believe that? That's like absolutely nuts right now. How many of you all, you had an amazing decade? If you're saying, man, if my next 10 years are anything like my last 10 years, that'll be boss. Who are you? Let me see who you are. Yeah, that is, so, I just hate all of you. All of you. All of you. Y'all just so saved. Now, how many of y'all, you like me, uh, and you ready to rinse off 2019 and most of that decade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ready to walk into something new, something fresh, something different. I don't know about y'all, but I need to be renewed. I, I need to be, I need to be uh, 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 re refreshed. I, I need to redefine some relationships in 2020. I need to return to some principles that I kind of laid down and forgot about. Uh, over the years. And I don't know, maybe that's you today. Maybe that's what brought you to church this weekend. If you're here for the first time or your first time in a long time, I don't think there could be a better time for you to hang out with us or tuning in with us online or on our, our YouTube channel for this video because we're starting a brand new series today called Resolve. Everybody say Resolve. Now, now, some of y'all are really into this. How many of y'all, you have already um, uh, started your, your New Year's resolution list? Who are you? Let me see who you are. How many of you, you have not made your New Year's resolution list, but you're going to get it done? Let me see who you are. How many of you, you already on page five of your list? You're like, this thing is going to be epic this year, right? Right? Feel you? Yeah, because it's that time of the year, right? I think, you know, we, 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 we're saying to ourselves, I don't want to change my life. I'm going to make my New Year's resolution list. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be better. And listen, we applaud that. We celebrate that. And if this is your first time or your first time in a long time and you don't really know how we roll here at Central Christian, we are all about that. We want to see you win. We want to see you get everything that God has for you. And we want to see you become all that God has called you to become. But I do want to caution you that there's some bad news for my New Year's resolutionist. It's so bad news. And the bad news is that although most people got great intentions of carrying out their New Year's resolution list, 92% research says, 92% of all people that start their New Year's resolutions on January 1 fail by Valentine's Day. That's bad news, right? 
And, and would you agree with me that a resolution is a goal? Would you agree with me a resolution is kind of a goal, right, of what we want to accomplish for the year? Some of you may be saying, well, Pastor Ray, why is it that 92% of people fail to accomplish their goal by Valentine's Day? That's a great question. Glad you asked. Research shows uh, this, uh, and I learned this. Watch this. Goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. Goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. And there's nothing wrong with having a goal, right? Goals are good things. You, you want to lose the weight. Uh, you want to be more organized. You want to save more money. You want to earn more money. You want to get that business started. You want to get off drugs and alcohol. You, you want to attend church more regularly. There's nothing wrong with those goals. Goals are good. The problem is goals by themselves don't determine success. Systems determine success. And so you may be saying, all right, uh, um, well, that makes sense. Well, friends, here's what I want to say to you, everybody. If we are looking to experience true breakthrough in 2020, if we don't want to fall victim to the 92% of people that fail by Valentine's Day or lose their momentum by St. Patrick's Day or completely fall off the wagon by Mother's Day, everybody, we got to take a good hard look at the systems that we have in place that will determine the success that we're trying to accomplish in 2020. I'm coming hard for you. Are y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? I'm coming hard for you early. And so some of you may be saying, well, Ray, uh, 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 what is the difference between successful people and other people? That's another great question. Glad you asked. There's a pastor by the name of Pastor Craig Rochelle of Life Church. Craig Rochelle says this. He says, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Which really spoke to me, Cap, because what that said to me is, it's not about your skin color. It's not about who you were uh, born with. It's not about uh, your education. Um, it's about the system that you're using. Now, now, maybe not here in Beloit, but I wonder, have you ever seen somebody that's crushing it? I mean, they are getting it done. They are living the life you want to live. They are doing the things you want to do. They're in places and spaces that you want to be in. And, and maybe I don't do this up here, but have you ever known somebody that looked at somebody and was like, man, what in the world do they got that I? That's just one person. I'm going to try it again. What in the world do they got that I? Don't got, yeah, yeah, y'all talk like that up here, huh? Okay, I thought so. Yeah, yeah. Here's the deal. I would submit to you that it's not uh, that they're better than you, more gifted than you, more talented than you, more educated than you. I would submit to you that they have a system that they're working. Because goals don't determine your success. Systems determine your success. And successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And I'm wondering, is there somebody in the room here who you want to be successful? Oh, don't be bashful. Don't you, don't you want to be, just me and Dave want to be successful? Come on. You want a greater, more intimate walk with Jesus. You want to see your prayer life go to another level. You want to be a more effective witness for the Lord. You want to be a more pro, uh, proficient provider for your family. You want to be a better husband. You want to be a better wife. You want to be a better mom. You want to be a better dad. You want your work, your career, your life to matter, not just now, but when you go home to see Jesus. Come on, who wants to be successful? Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. And so when I discovered everybody, that statistic, that 92%, it was sobering for me. And maybe for some of you sitting here this morning, a little bit intimidating, you know. Uh, you may be of a realist mindset, like my beautiful wife is a realist. Now, I'm an optimist. My wife is a realist. And so that kind of, you know, we, we bump heads on some things, how we see things. All right? And so if you're for the realist mentality, you may be saying to yourself, well, Ray, thanks a lot, bro, for stepping on my dreams before the year even get here. 92%? Well, dang. You know? I mean, why even try? Why even put in the energy? Why even put in the effort? I mean, the numbers are the numbers, right? And besides, I've tried and failed so many times to accomplish my goals and make changes to my life and see those fresh and new and different things happen for me. Because I always seem to find myself right back where I started. Man, I take two steps forward just to have life show up and knock me five steps back. I got one or two people. All right, all right. Well, everybody, 
I want you to grab onto my coattails today because Central, when, when, when I researched that number and I recognized, watch this, the why behind the what of the 92%, it didn't discourage me. Man, it, it, it motivated me. It lit a fire under me. It created a hunger and a thirst inside of me to get this 8% figured out. Because I can't speak for everybody else in the room today, but I can't go into 2020 with the same mentality that I had finishing in 2019. I can't operate at the same capacity I did last year and think that's going to be good enough. I can't have the same mindset and get done what I need to get done. I can't make the same mistakes last year th that I'm going to make this year and don't think that's not going to cost me. I can't waste time rolling around with people that drain me and don't deposit into me. Guys, I got to resolve this year. This got to be my make it or break it year. It, it's got to. Yeah. I got no more time to waste. I got no more time to play. I got no more time to wander around lost and aimless. Man, I know there is greater for me. I know there is greater in me. And I know God wants to do great things through me and my, by myself this morning. Yeah. And this year, more than anything, more than any time, I got to resolve that I want to begin to see some stuff manifest in 2020 that God wants to do in me and through me. It's got to happen. And today, everybody, I want to help all of us hold and maintain our resolve so that we'll begin to see some stuff. I want to provide for you a system that I think will help us get to where God wants us to get. If you feeling this and you in, I need somebody to say, I'm in. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, I got you. And so to help us with this lesson today, I want to introduce you to a person in Scripture who the more I hang out with this dude, the more I fall more and more in love with him. He's becoming one of my favorite Bible characters uh, in Scripture in this season of my life. A young brother by the name of Daniel. Anybody know about Daniel? Let me give you some fun facts about Daniel in case you don't know who he is. Now, the Bible suggests, everybody, that not only was Daniel uh, strong, good-looking, and healthy. I'm like, yeah I, can, yeah, I appreciate that about you. Yeah, I'm liking that. I'm liking that. But here's the other thing about Daniel that I appreciate. The Bible says it suggests that Daniel was very, very intelligent and very sharp. He was very intelligent and he was very sharp. Now, you do know there's a difference, right? You know, you can be super intellectual. Not real practical. Got a whole lot of book sense. Not a whole lot of common sense. Dudes that will crush you in the classroom but to get lost walking around the block. You know some of them folk? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, the Bible says, everybody, that Daniel was that guy. Not only was he super intellectually smart, but he was very, very just practically smart. He was that guy. The, the Bible says he, was, uh, he had the ability, God gave him the ability to, to, to interpret dreams and visions. The Bible says that he was extremely wise. Uh, he had excellent people skills. Not only could he converse with the most powerful man in the country, like the king, he could also connect uh, with the common uh, uh, worker of the king. He was just anybody that Daniel came in contact with. God gave him great favor with those people. And, and, and the Bible also talks about him being hard, uh, a, com a hard and committed worker. He was loyal. Uh, to his friends, and the Bible says verbatim in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, that he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. You, you guys can probably see why I like this guy so much, right? It, it, he's a great dude. I'm like, okay. I want to introduce you to how the Bible uh, intros Daniel into us in Scripture. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says that in the third year of the reign of, Je of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles for the temple of God. Everybody, let me just give you a little bit of a summary. And so what happens is, is Daniel was living in Jerusalem. King Jehoiakim was Daniel's king. And the Bible says that this pagan king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar shows up. Say pagan. I want to make sure you guys understand. Now, you know, a pagan, a pagan was somebody that came from a polytheistic society. Poly means multiple. Theism represents God. And so if you're a polytheistic, that means that you served multiple gods. Of course, Daniel's culture and our culture here in the Christian church were monotheistic. So if polytheistic, they serve how many? 
multiple gods. Monotheism represents, uh, that means that we serve only See, that's why I love this class. You guys are so awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so here's Nebuchadnezzar. He attacks Jerusalem, and he lays waste to the city. The Jewish encyclopedia would suggest that Nebuchadnezzar kills Jehoiakim right out in cold blood in front of everybody and lays his carcass out in front so the whole country can see. And not only that, but it probably suggests that he did that to multiple innocent men, women, and children. Yeah, just Nebuchadnezzar was a bad dude. And then what he decided to do was he decided to take uh, 10,000 of the best and the brightest of Jerusalem to serve him and his court all the way in Babylon. And Bible says in Jan uh, Daniel chapter 1 verse 6 that among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, and three of his best friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so what happens is uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes D Daniel and these 10,000 people plus his three best friends on a 500-mile journey from Jerusalem, and they had to walk all the way to Babylon. And then he employed them into a three-year training program to where he would force them to learn Babylonian culture, in a foreign land, in a foreign country, under a foreign roof, as if to try to wipe away all of Daniel and his friends past. And then, as part of the training regiment, he was forced to eat food from the king's table. But here is where we get a glimpse of Daniel's character and his resolve. Because in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says that, um, um, that Daniel resolved, say resolved, not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. One more time, say resolve. resolve. For my note takers, everybody, that word resolve literally means to be firmly determined. For, for my note takers, that word resolve, everybody, literally means to decide firmly on a course of action. And if I was to submit to you guys uh, this morning... I would submit to you, everybody, that if anybody had an excuse to not be resolved, if anybody had an excuse to not be firmly committed to a direction of following God, it's this dude, Daniel. I mean, guys, think about it. When Daniel was taken from Jerusalem, he was a teenage kid. My research shows that he was probably somewhere between 14 and 17 years old when his parents were killed literally right in front of him. And he was snatched from his hometown of Jerusalem to take in, and been taken into Babylon captivity, right? Just a crazy deal. Literally, everybody trapped in a situation that he didn't ask for or seek out. Forced to have to answer to a person in power over you that you're not in favor of. Forced to function and exist in an environment where there's, where there's nowhere near godly or nowhere near virtuous. See, y'all thought I was just still talking about Daniel. Anybody in here ever been and had to exist in a toxic, ungodly environment? And when you're in that type of space, what is the uh, incentive of living godly while everybody else and everything else around you is worldly and unruly and everybody, and yet this teenage boy, had a resolve about him that made the statement that no matter what my situation and my circumstances are around me, I will not let the wrong that's happening around me to negatively impact and affect me, but rather I will choose to trust the one who lives within me to shine the light of Christ through me so that no matter how dark it might be, his light will guard my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. That's why I like this guy. That's why I like this guy. And so some of you may be saying to yourself, Ray, tell us, how was he able to do that, though? How was he able to have that level of resolve? And I'll tell you, Daniel had a system that I think would be a blessing to all of us today. Number one, the first thing he did was he had a resolve to maintain a committed, consistent prayer life. Did I just say he had a resolve to maintain a prayer life? No, no, no. I said he had a resolve to maintain a committed, consistent prayer life. You do know there's a difference, right? Because, see, successful people do consistently what other people do 
occasionally. Yeah, and, and now let me show you, everybody. Um, um, the Bible says, now, he was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. He served Nebuchadnezzar. I, I'll give you the cliff note version. Uh, because of how he served Nebuchadnezzar, he found great favor under Nebuchadnezzar. And then we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 6. Now he's under a new king, whole new administration, a guy by the name of Darius, just as crazy as King Nebuchadnezzar. All right? And so now he's under a new system, new government, and, and, and this guy, Darius, doesn't really know Daniel, but he heard some good things about him. And so he's saying to himself, you know what, um, check it out. Uh, da uh, Daniel, I heard some good things about you. I'm going to pick you and a couple of other people to uh, kind of run my, my administration, all right? And the Bible says that Daniel got in there and he started crushing it. He started killing it to the point where Darius was like, well, snap, look at this little Jewish boy. <laughs> killing it. What I need all these other people for? I'm going to put Daniel in charge of everything. And so the other wise men and the administrators looked at Daniel was like, this doggone Jewish kid, he is killing it right now. He done cost me my Christmas bonus. We got to do something about this guy, right? And so they get together to say, we got to figure out a way to take this dude down. And so they were looking for a way to catch him up in some corruption. But I told you earlier the character of Daniel, right? The Bible says in Daniel uh, chapter 6, it says that he was faithful, always, what? responsible, and completely trustworthy. And so they're like, oh, snap, he don't do nothing wrong. He not like us. Okay, only way we're going to trip this dude Daniel up is we got to get him conflicted with his God. And so they walk up to King Darius and like, King Darius, what's up? You're awesome. You're so awesome, we think you ought to do something. We think you ought to write a law that says for the next 30 days, nobody is permitted to pray to anybody or any other God other than you. And if they do, they're getting thrown in the lion's den. Darius heard the plan, the idea. He said, hmm, no one prays to nobody but me? Hmm, I am pretty awesome. That's a great idea. Let's do it, right? And so he agrees and signs it into law. And the Bible says, everybody, that when Daniel heard about the decree that went down, in verse 10 of chapter 6, it says, Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows uh, toward, or open toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, watch this, just as he had done before. Yeah, see, watch this. This wasn't just an emergency situation. Daniel had a consistent, a committed prayer life, right? And basically, the statement he was making is, I know how crazy it may be, but whether I'm up, whether I'm down, whether things are going for me, whether things are going against me, I'm not going to allow myself to waver. I'm going to continue to look to the hills from where my help comes from, knowing all of my help comes from the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Bottom line, my source don't come from people. I'm not going to depend on the boss man. I'm not going to depend on the weather man. I'm not going to depend on Pac Man. I'm going to depend on Jesus, right, to help me through this situation, right? And so he continues to pray. And then the, 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 the wise men catch him praying, and they drag him before King Darius. And they're like, yo, Darius, your golden boy was praying to his God instead of you. He got to go in the lion's den. King Darius is like, oh, snap, they got me. So he didn't want that to happen. He loved Dan Daniel. He loved Daniel. And so this pagan king, because he signed it in the law, had to see it through. So kicking and screaming, he basically is forced to throw Daniel in the lion's den. And he said to him before he put him in there, he's like, Daniel, I hope your God can get you out of this one. He done done some crazy things before. We'll see what he does this time, right? Seals the lion's den tomb, and the Bible says, everybody, this pagan king didn't sleep a wink that night. As soon as daybreak hit, runs. A king ran. Kings don't run. You hear me? This man ran to the tomb, got up to him. He was like, yo, Daniel, you all right? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Yeah. And, and, and the Bible says that Daniel said, may the king live forever. I'm cool, bruh. 
You read it. That's just what it said. Yeah, that's what it said. Yeah, yeah. He said, he said, an angel, God sent an angel to shut the mouth of the lion so that your servant remained unharmed. Daniel had a committed, consistent prayer life. And so that when he called on the Lord, he showed up. And may I suggest to you today is the problem with many of us, even in the church, is we don't have a committed, consistent prayer life. We have an occasional prayer life. And what happens is when all hell is breaking loose in our life, that's when we want to drop to our knees and pray. And, 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 and what happens is it's, it's when the lions uh, of sickness and the lions of divorce, and the lions of eviction, and the lions of addiction, and the lions of termination show up in our life. That's when we want to pray. That's when we want to seek God. But can I say this, everybody? If you have an occasional prayer life, you're going to get occasional results. I got one. If you have an occasional prayer life, you're going to get occasional results. But if you have a consistent prayer life, come on, somebody, you're going to get consistent results. Somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. Yeah. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, you jacked up. Amen. Yes, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. First system of Daniel. He had to resolve everybody to have a consistent, committed Prayer life, I would suggest to you that that's what we need going into 2020. What does that look like for you? Daniel played three times a day. What does that look like for you to set your alert to say, this time every day I'm praying. This time and this time daily I'm seeking God. Super practical that we can do. And we ain't got to be boastful about it. We ain't got to be like, oh, my thing is ringing. I'm about to go to pray to the God of the universe. No, we ain't got to do that. <laughs> you know, that thing ring like, you know what, I got a conference call. It's very important. I got to take it. And you're going to have a business meeting with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ about some things concerning you, your family, your business, your ministry. Does this make sense? We can do that. Daniel had a consistent, committed prayer. But number two, everybody, uh, Daniel resolved himself to God's purposes instead of his own. He resolved himself to God's purposes instead of his own. Uh, Y'all remember, and uh, oh, let me give you this. Just teaching point really quickly. Um, here's a teaching point for my note takers. Um, he had to resolve that no matter where I am, I'm going to operate in the truth of who I am. No matter where I am, I'm going to operate in the truth of who I am. That makes sense? Let me help you for a minute. Uh, you remember in Daniel chapter 1, I told you that Daniel resolved not to eat from the king's table. And he asked permission from the chief that was over him to allow him to do that. So the chief was like, Daniel, I like you. I like you a lot. But man... You, you got to eat them burgers and fries that the king is serving. Daniel's like, I don't want to eat that junk. I don't eat like that. He says, but listen, if you don't eat what the king is serving you, and you show up in front of him pale and weak, he's going to kill me. Daniel says, let me tell you, give me 10 days. Me and my three boys, we're going we to eat vegetables. That's where we get the Daniel fast from, everybody, the Daniel fast. Well, all we're going to eat is vegetables for 10 days. And if you see us after 10 days and we look weak and we look feeble, all right, we'll go ahead and eat the pork chops and the bacon and the sausage. We'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. Okay. The Bible says after 10 days, Daniel and his three buddies showed up and they looked more fit and more strong and more nourished than the people eating from the king's table. And then in Daniel chapter 1, Verse 18, it says, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, and the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel and his three best friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. And the Bible says in verse 21, and Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, what I just read for you guys is very significant, and I don't want you to miss it. This is my favorite point out of all the three I'm going to give you. I, the, the point that I'm making is he resolved himself to God's purposes instead of his own. Now, I just told you he had a consistent, committed prayer life, right? Uh, do y'all, don't y'all think that a part of Daniel's prayer life was 
God, I love you. Get me the heck up out of here. You don't think he asked him that? He's in a foreign land with people trying to kill him, trying to take him out, trying to backstab him, trying to bring him down. You don't think that Daniel was like, God, this is not where I want to be. This is not who I want to be living with. I want to go home. You don't think he asked God for that on a consistent basis? Yeah. Come on now. Nevertheless, I bet you he finished his prayer, but, but God, not my will, but your will be done. His resolve was to be committed to God's purposes instead of his own. And I say that to say to somebody today, see, we have this misnomer in the Christian church. That if you do everything that God told you to do, if you go to church, if you say your prayers, if you're good to people, if you're, being, if you're obedient, then everything's going to work out for you just the way you want it to work out. Where, where the real people at? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate that. Yeah. Y'all do recognize that that's not how this thing works, right? Hey, how do you know you have resolve? You don't know you have resolve when everything is working out the way you want it to work out. You don't know you have resolve when all your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed. You know you have resolve when all hell is breaking loose in your life, but you got a commitment to say, no matter what, I'm going to follow you, God, whether it's working out for me, whether I'm where I want to be, or whether all hell is breaking loose in my life, I will follow you. I am not going to turn back. I'm going to continue to follow you and trust you every step of the way. That's how you know. And you may not be where you want to be right now. You may not be doing what you want to do right now. It's in that place where you trust God with it. Will you say to yourself, no matter where I am, I will still operate in the truth of who I am. I'm not going to pout. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to fuss. I'm going to trust God because I know his purposes are greater than my purposes, and I know he's got a plan for my life. It's not about me. Let me share this really quickly. Next month, I will celebrate one year that my father passed away. Many of you guys, especially at this service, you know, I shared about that um, last year, and um, you know that wasn't my plan. My plan was that my dad would be here to see this. My plan was that my dad would be here uh, to see this season of my life. My plan was that my dad would see here to see me in my new home. My, dad, my plan was my dad would see me pastoring a church. We prayed. We fasted. I lost 18 pounds fasting and believing that God was going to heal my dad. I got a prayer group of my family members together. We were faithful. Every week we prayed, same time. Same day, God said, I got a better plan. And he took him. And this time last week, I didn't even tell my wife this, but I was dealing with that. I'm driving up here, having my devotion time, 70 minute drive, five days a week when I come up here to hang out with you guys. And I said to myself, My father is gone. You know what I said next? Not that I didn't already know it, but it was just different this time. I said, God, you're my father now. He was always my father, but y'all know what I mean, right? A little bit different now. You're my father now. What my plan? And if I had a, gotten to a corner somewhere and pouted and said, this Christian stuff don't work, I quit, I'm going to go do something else with my life, Two things I believe would have happened. Number one, there's a whole lot of people that wouldn't be blessed because I wasn't operating in the space and the, and the place where God called me to operate in. That's number one. Yeah, I appreciate that. I love y'all. I love y'all. For real. But number two, I believe my father would have came down from heaven. <laughs> JC, give me a minute. I, I got to run this errand. Smack me upside the head and be like, boy, get your act together. I'm all right. I'll see you in a little while. And went back up to be with Jesus. I firmly believe it would have happened. I firmly believe it would have happened. Yeah. 
It's not about me. Sometimes God's will is for us to go through the tough stuff. Y'all do recognize Daniel being in Babylon was God's will. You recognize that, right? You need a Bible verse, don't you? Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. You know I'm going to give you scripture. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged. Look at verse 2. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. It was God's will. And sometimes, everybody, it's God's will for us to be in a tough space. Not because he's trying to punish us. But maybe it's because he wants to see what our resolve is. I said, maybe it's because he wants to see what our resolve is. Amen? Are we firmly determined to continue to seek God even when things aren't operating and working the way we want it to work? I would say to you that this guy, Daniel, he had a resolve to a committed, consistent prayer life. Number two, he had a resolve to God's purposes instead of his own. Here's the third one, and we're about to go, is he had a resolve to do life with like-minded people. Here's my coaching point for my note takers. Uh, Who's in your crew? You don't need a lot. You only need a few. Who's in your crew? Daniel had his crew, his best friends. Uh, What's his name? Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. Y'all may know them more by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, those are Daniel's boys. Those were their Babylonian names, but they're given Jewish names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Yeah, Daniel's boys. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Yeah, yeah, you learned something today. Yeah, good, good, good. Let me tell you what happened. So King Nebuchadnezzar, I'm tired of saying Nebuchadnezzar. Can I say King Neb? Nebuchadnezzar is just too much of a King Neb, King Neb, everybody. He had a dream, and the dream disturbed him, woke him up. He was like, oh, snap, I had this crazy dream. All right? He called all the magicians and the wise men and was like, look, I had this crazy dream. Here's what I need y'all to do. Y'all tell me the dream and tell me what it means. The wise men was like, you must be out your, I mean, oh, king. What are you talking about? Tell you the dream? Who can tell a man his dream? It'd be one thing if you tell us the dream. They will tell you what it means. But you want us to tell you what you dreamed and tell you what it means? You lost your mind. It's in the Bible. He, they said nobody can do that except for God. No, King Ned was like, you, you're a magician, right? you that mystic dude, right? You can see stuff, right? Well, tell me the dream and tell me what it means. Or I'm killing you and your whole family. I told you Nebuchadnezzar was crazy. They're like, King, there's no way we can do that. He's like, I hate y'all. I'm killing you all. And so, yeah, it's in the Bible. And so Neb was like, I'm killing all these people. And then the guard, now Daniel wasn't in that first meeting. They knock on Daniel's door, and the guard was like, Daniel, I've come to kill you. Daniel's like, uh, really? It's Christmas. What happened? Right? The guard told Daniel what happened. Daniel runs to the king, says, king, don't stress out. Give us a little bit more time. We will tell you what your dream meant what your dream means. And then here's what Daniel does in chapter 2, verse 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And watch this, verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Who's in your crew? I will submit to you that you don't need a lot of people, but you do need a few. Can I say to you guys, Daniel has some people in his circle, three guys that was committed to doing life with them, that was committed to going in the same direction that Daniel was going in, that was committed to living a lifestyle that Daniel wanted to live. And why is this important for us in church today? Because everybody, the people in your crew might not be your boyfriend or your husband. The people in your crew might not be your girlfriend or your wife. Yeah, they might not. 
They might not be the people who you're closest with because God is doing the work in your life, but God ain't doing nothing in their life. And y'all literally are going in opposite directions and you trying to hold it together. I mean, you made a resolution, man, I'm staying off the fried food. Your husband walk in with a bucket of Popeyes. Who's hungry? I mean, my God. <laughs> right? And so in that case, you better have some people in your life that are trying to go in the same direction that you're trying to go in, that will encourage you not to stray, that will encourage you and pray for you when you're having a weak moment, that will keep you on the path that you committed to yourself and going in while everybody else around you is doing something crazy and different. Who's in your crew? You don't need a lot. You just need a few. And if you don't have those people right now, you better hire some people. You better enlist some people. You better find some people that you can bring in to your close and be like, look, I need to do life with you. I need you in my life. This past Friday, my wife and I was with a couple who we're going to be doing life with. And it was a beautiful time. We ate together, laughed together, prayed together, cried together. It was beautiful. Well, they cried. You know, I don't cry. I ain't doing that crying stuff. <laughs> Sam, Sam. But it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Beautiful. And what I'm saying to you, everybody, is you need those people in your life. Who are they that's going to help you get to where you want to be? Is this making sense, church? Now, the temptation, everybody, will be, you know what, Ray, I'm fired up. Let's get this done. I'm going to make my list of things that I'm going to get done, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That's dangerous. Here's my last coaching point for you before we go have brunch. My last coaching point, everybody, is I don't want you to focus on the do. I want you to focus on the who. Who is it that you want to become? So many times we focus on the action that we're not focused on the transformation in our hearts. And that's why so many people fail by Valentine's Day because it's just, just all about getting stuff done. But it's not all about a transformation. And when we focused on who is it that we want to become, it's amazing how the do flows from the who. Let me, let me show you a, a, a chart that I created. I'm so proud of this chart. Don't this look nice and neat? I love this. Yeah, yeah. So this is my do list, do, do goals. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to stop abusing drugs and alcohol. I'm going to start tithing, giving more. I'm going to stop procrastinating. I'm going to stop lying, disappointing my family and my friends. Now, is there anything wrong with this do list? It's a good do list, right? Here's my point. If you focus on the who, it's amazing how the do will flow from the who. Now, look at the who list. I, I want to be healthier versus stop abusing drugs and alcohol. No, I want to be clean. Uh, versus start tithing, giving more, that's the do. Now, I want to be a good steward. I want to be more disciplined. I want to be more trustworthy. And if you take a good heart at this list, that those who goals basically is you saying, you know what, I want to be more like Jesus. And if I'm more like Jesus, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to be healthier because I recognize that my body is a gift and a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to treat it as such. If I, if I want to be more like Jesus, I'm going to be a good steward because I recognize that every single gift and purpose I have doesn't come from me, but it comes from heaven above. This is making sense, church, right? I, I'm going to be more trustworthy because I know that my Jesus is trustworthy because I trust what he did for me on the cross when he died for my sin and gave me an opportunity to spend eternity with my God in heaven. And because I trust him, I want to reciprocate that trust to every single person that I'm with. And when we focus on being like Jesus, it's amazing how some of these other things will fall into place. And so some of you may be saying, well, Ray, you don't understand. I've, I've failed so many times. Don't forget who you are in Scripture. Last slide, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. It says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we die with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Now you're free from your slavery to sin. And you have become slaves to righteous living. Ain't that good news? That's who you are. So I don't want you to replay 
the tape of the past, saying, man, I tried this before, fell short, failed, didn't make it. God says, you're in Christ now. And because you're in Christ, you're a brand new creation. Old things are passed away. Lord, all things are become new. And I got some new stuff for you in 2020 that I want to see you accomplish, that I want to see you walk in, because you can do it. All you needed was a system. Because uh, we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. Successful people do consistently. The other people do occasionally. What we're going to do this year is we're going to commit to a consistent, committed prayer life. Are you with me? We're going to be resolved to God's purposes, not just our own. It's not about us. We're going to be resolved to put people around us that's going to do life with us and keep us accountable to the direction that we're going to go in. And if that happens, watch out 2020. We're going to be a brand new us, and we're going to take this thing over for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. pray. Father, we need your help to do this. God, brand new year is among us, and we want to do some things differently. We want to see some things differently. We want to accomplish some great things for you. We can't do it by ourselves, God. Help us to maintain our resolve, God. Help us to work this system, this biblical system that you've given us through your servant Daniel. And God, we know that if we do that, Father God, we will be who you called us to be. And we'll give your name all the praise and glory and honor for what you do in us and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and let everybody in the house say amen. God bless you guys. I love you. We're so glad you were able to catch this week's message online. And we'd love to see you at the service. Join us live Saturday night at 5 or on Sunday at 8.15, 9, and 10.30. Have a great week.